Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So the next two interviews that you're going to hear are with Eden Rahim. He is Next Edge Capital, and he's going to be talking about biotech funds. Sounds on some level not that interesting, I suppose, uh, for some of the listeners out there, but the reality is it's incredibly interesting. It's about the ripple effect. It's about the little things. It's about investing. It's about biologic uh, drugs that are in development. Over 900 of them, actually, are in development. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about idiosync syncratic risk. We're going to talk about um, what, what's going on in this field and what's actually happening. Eden refers to, to this field as a uh, virtuous industry, which, which I absolutely love. So I think there's, there's a whole lot here going on, way more going on than meets the eyes. So I hope you enjoy uh, this interview. Uh, Eden Rahim from Next Edge Capital. So welcome to Face to Face, and we are joined by another very special guest today. Eden Rahim is here. Actually, he's a, a returning guest, and every now and then I do have the odd returning guest, and it's always a real honor and a real privilege. Eden's uh, an old friend, but also uh, a very talented um, fund manager and is running a, a fund called Next Edge. Finish it off for me, Eden. Biotech Plus Fund. The Next Edge Biotech Plus Fund. Can you tell that I didn't come up with that name? <laughs> That's what I just want to tell my listeners right out of the gate. Uh, Eden's uh, been involved in the investment industry for years, and we're probably going to hear a little bit more about that. We might get into your history a little bit. But anyway, thanks for joining us today, Eden. Delighted to be here, David. Yeah. And uh, I think on a fir- first podcast, we, um, we covered a lot of the... Uh, the unique stories about being in this industry. And, we did, yeah, yes. And I, believe it or not, I checked, and I'm, I'm about to publish, I think, about 100 and, 180 interviews. I mean, I've probably pushed 220 now, all in, but on Face to Face, about 180, and I think you were number three. Number six. Three, number six. <laughs> yeah. Number six. I knew it was. I knew it was pretty early on. So, I think um, Matt Desero is pretty happy. He was just ahead of me. He was just ahead of you. That's right. Matt Desero was, uh, yeah, right out, of, right out of the gate. Yes. Yes. And I think for those of you who are interested, you should go back and hear it. It was a very interesting interview. Um, you can even hear the wine glasses tinkling uh, in the background. It was a nice Australian Shiraz. That was the Elderton Command Shiraz, <laughs> one of the best in the world. I wouldn't forget it. That's awesome. So the conversation meant nothing to you. But the red wine spoke to you. That, that's why I was there. Yes, <laughs> heavenly experience. Yeah. Why Next Edge? What's so Next Edge about Next Edge? So Next Edge is a firm that evolved from Man Canada, which is a firm that specialized in alternative assets. So they have a unique mandate. So they, they pursue unique strategies, whether it's in private debt, um, alternative yield, and something like uh, like biotech, which is the only biotech fund of its kind in Canada. So that's that's really why they they specialize in unconventional sources of return. How how is it the only kind of kind of its fund like this in Canada? I mean, this seems like a. I mean, we're going to talk about innovation. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty innovative. I mean, is that part of the reason why it's not? Um, in Canada, um, investors tend to like their resources, stuff you dig out of the ground, right. and their financial companies and their yield uh, investments. Uh, so, some more, some more secure, Eden? Is that uh, what I'm well, hearing? that's a barbell approach, right? So, you've got the secure investments in the yield investments, and you've got the um, uh, riskier investments in resources. So, they um, they tend to favor, you know, either or, or both, but there isn't um, a deep fabric of investing in biotech in Canada. Now, there was a period where the sector became favorable, but that was investing in especially pharma, and what they were were essentially financial roll-up companies. There weren't really R&D investments. They weren't creating new products. They were simply buying products and accruing earnings. That's an entirely different model. But there is a history of 
some great innovation in Canada in biotech healthcare in the 1990s. Um, the first original successful HIV drug, 3TC, was created by Biochem Pharma, and that became a billion dollar drug. Canadian company, we had um, uh, QLT create a drug called Visudine, um, and uh, we had uh, Angiotech create a drug, uh, a, a device, a, a drug coated stent to reduce uh, clotting. And so there is a history of that success. Um, but we haven't seen that in, over the past decade. Drug, drug coated stents, I'm pretty sure they used those in, the, in parties in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, listen, there was a lot of Led Zeppelin going on. That's in the background, right. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but it sounds fascinating. So, so Next Edge is truly for you, not only, uh, and, and I know this a little bit about your academic history and what you studied and so on as an undergrad, but uh, um, Next Edge for you really is about what's next? That's is right. It about, is it about the discovery? Is it about, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about those types of companies that you're investing in, because mm -hmm. I don't think you're investing in startups. No, you're, you're going in a little farther. You're going in with some proved data. You've got some evidence to say this is not such a bad idea after all. Absolutely, um, investing in biotech. It's all about risk reward. There is idiosyncratic risk associated with investing in the space, and what that means is that unlike virtually any other sector, you are investing in a company that re reaches certain binary thresholds. And at those binary thresholds, either the company reports good data or bad data. If it's good, the company may soar hundreds of percent. If it's bad, it may go down 60, 70, 80, 90%. So it's not the sort of sector that an investor necessarily wants to um, invest in individually because they're taking a disproportionate amount of risk. But in an investment vehicle such as our fund, they can participate in the exciting growth in the sector without having to take that individual company risk. We have over 20 years experience investing in the space. We have a discipline on how we choose investments and how we hedge investments, protect investments, what part of the cycle we invest in, how long we hold it for, where do we step aside before these binary events. We have a, a long discipline that's associated with investing. Is, is biotech, is Next Edge sort of on the edge because it's, it's a, like as you said, it's a space that is, I don't know, it's unfamiliar, it's, it's still really new, it is really risky, I suppose. I mean, when I, what little I know about uh, some of these pharmacological sort of insights, and I'm actually benefiting from one, I've, yeah. I've got psoriatic arthritis, I'm on Enbrel, uh, we've chatted about this before, but without the space you're working in, that drug wouldn't have been discovered. So um, I'm wondering, is it is it almost too flighty for, for your typical investor, in a sense, um, to do on their own? Yeah, it, it's it's a very complex sector, and to um, to hand <coughs> excuse me to handicap and do the work that's necessary to understand the science and technology behind it, um, at what points you should invest in it. It really, is, it really is quite complex. You have to read through um, scientific papers, you have to speak to key opinion leaders, and, and handicap outcomes. And so it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's for the average investors. Obviously there, there will be some that, mm -hmm. for whom they're highly skilled at doing so, but it's, it's generally not. What's your, what's your background academically? I know oh, I did my undergrad in molecular genetics and traded my way through university. Um, um, in the 1980s, but um, and when I got to RBC, um, I joined RBC as a derivatives analyst. But um, each of the different sectors in the market were managed by different PMs, and nobody really wanted biotech. So I was the Mikey um, right. that was assigned. Right. right, and that's a reference we just lost at least 50% of the audience on. <laughs> oh, the old anyway, Mikey yeah. commercial? That's right, okay. yeah. yeah, the life cereal. Yes, yes. that's right, yeah. exactly, yeah. <laughs> he won't eat it, he hates everything. Yes, give it to Mikey. Yeah, hey Mikey, he likes it, yeah. That was me. So have you in a sense, so you've got a background clearly in this sort of scientific world or in, in, a, in a, I mean molecular genetics, Probably not what everybody's going into in the heart of sciences, really, are they? Well, now they are. Now Appar they are. Apparently, yeah. there is a big waiting list for it, and and justifiably so. It really is. It's a transformative field. I mean, drug innovation has changed. 
the skill sets that are needed are changed. My, my son did his undergrad in molecular genetics and I looked at what he did and it is vastly more complex and difficult compared to when I did it. And it's just remarkable um, what these young students learn now and, and the power that's at their fingertips um, in, this, in this field. And uh, it, I still think it remains one of the most exciting fields to, so to were be you, in. So were you kind of at the time, and I think I get, I get that from you know, the, the reference, but yeah. you were the lone wolf in a sense. You were, there, there probably weren't a lot of you at the time. No, there wasn't even a program. Yeah. It wasn't even a program in molecular genetics. I actually um, was going was gonna to go into either engineering or maybe try my hand at med school, but I fainted at the side of blood, so med school was out. <laughs> so engineering and then Genentech went public while I was in high school and Genentech was the first biotech company and the stock IPO'd at I think around 26 and it closed at 86 mm. and there was a huge excitement surrounding it and I remember hearing the news about that at the time and I said and I said I want in that's it was it was it was it science fiction you back then I mean I mean when I say back then it's yeah. so long ago and it's really not but in the, that world it's a long time. Yeah, and you know the first introduction really to biotech, if you remember Blade Runner, yeah, which I know course. you love and we both love. Um, so Blade Runner, you, 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 know, you, you see um, biotech being discussed in its infancy and it's actually remarkably accurate. You know, the writing was so good that the, the use of biotech terms in there was actually quite accurate. And that was literally the time that biotech was born. So it's quite remarkable. And it was, and it, it was an exciting time. And you know, we talked about this in, in, in the first interview. It's just, it was a formative stage. So this industry is actually really young. It's just one generation I mean, in, old. In, so in a way, I mean, you go, I mean, really, this is ridiculous to say this based on, you know, all of a couple of minutes talking about your history and, you know, academic life and so on. But in a sense, I think, by the sounds of it, you were kind of always on the next edge if you will. That's right. Um, I, it, there, is, there is something highly appealing and exciting about, about things that will change the world as we know it. And, you know, biotech is front and center. Um, and we've definitely seen that happen, seen it unfold. I mean, the innovations that have come of age. I mean, you know, we've, the first generation of recombinant drugs, we saw address chronic medical needs, and now the tools that have been developed and the speed of processing that's developed are making a whole new generation. So right now, one of the most exciting things happening in cancer is, so for two generations, we've had to deal with the toxicity of something medieval like chemotherapy. Methotrexate. That's right, absolutely. And, but now, there was a little biotech company called Metarex that was acquired by Bristol Myers in March of 2009 that transformed a sleepy old pharma company into the most one of the most one of the fastest growing pharma companies mm -hmm. in the world and what they did was they had the ability to cause your immune system to react against cancer cells and it's the biggest, it's called immuno-oncology. Which and is completely turning the disease on its head. It's turning the disease on its head because now you're not using to toxic chemo, so you have drugs like Optivo and K Keytruda from Merck that's transforming cancer therapy, and that's just the beginning. What is about to unfold in this entire field is so exciting. And this is just one, this is just this is one, just one segment. So, so, so I think I read recently, and I, maybe we can talk about this in, in part two of, of this series, but, but there's over 900 That's dr correct. drugs in, in um, what would you say, in research and development phases, of a variety of different phases, I guess, trials and so on? Precisely. And they're addressing a, a huge um, uh, range of unmet medical needs. And what's remarkable is, is that, so we've had, you know, small molecule therapeutics addressing a variety of ailments, you know, for 50, 60, 70 years. But now we have the tools using cell biology, molecular biology, to create new therapeutics that modify the disease. So these are disease modifying therapeutics that are coming and that's a huge difference. So for instance, take something like Alzheimer's. Oh, let's go back to the, the, the 
the PD-1 and checkpoint inhibitors that Bristol-Myers adds. So cancer cells, some cancer cells, produces an excess of something called PD-1. And what PD-1 does, it suppresses the body's immune system from attacking the cancer cells. So we, um, Bristol-Myers and Merck were able to create something called a checkpoint inhibitor that suppresses the PD-1 and allows the body to now attack the cancer cells, right? Now, on the other hand, you've got something like Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's, there is it's the biggest unmet medical need hmm. that, is, that exists right now. It's epidemic. There are over 5 million people in North America suffering from it. It'll grow to 15 million in the next generation. The cost of the system is huge. It is debilitating. And we're, we're just in the early stage of discovering um, how to possibly address that. Much like your Enbrel mm -hmm. works, an anti-TNF alpha inhibitor, the way that's being used, that's in clinical trials right now, is all to, also to use an antibody response to break down plaques that build up in your brain. That's the path that's being pursued with Alzheimer's. But there has been no new Alzheimer's drugs approved in 12 years. Wow. And the only drugs approved are symptomatic. They're not disease modifying. So not only is this a massive, massive human risk, yes. it's also a massive opportunity as well. Absolutely. So we own eight companies that are in various stages of development addressing Alzheimer's. Now think about how vast the opportunity is. You don't need all eight to work. Right. You just need one to work and it'll right. be up thousands of percent. Right. Right? You can have three or four that fail, and lots of companies have failed in Alzheimer's. In fact, virtually every company has failed in Alzheimer's. So, so, so what do you want? Do you want to find the, the, the cure for Alzheimer's, or do you want to make a thousand percent? So, this is a virtuous industry. Yeah, you've, you've used that phrase before, and yes. I, I love it. I mean, yeah. a, a nice way to impose Aristotelian ethics. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It, it, no, it's it, is, awesome. it is a virtuous industry. You are... Well, you, Eden, what I just and maybe we can talk about this yeah. too at another time. But uh, you know, I've just come from a financial conference today, actually talking about responsible investing and this whole idea of sustainable investing. Yeah, yeah I, I I did not see that coming. You, you at a financial no, I conference? Know, I know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You must have been you must have been ambushed somehow. I was yeah. indeed yes by several. Yeah. Um, but it kind of redefines impact investing in a way. Typically, impact investing is defined, I think, frankly, in a really myopic way. Yeah. This is this has changed. I think this kind of changes the conversation a little bit. Yeah, you know, the financial industry it's it's pretty much been the tried and true along the way, and there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of duplication. You know, everyone reproduces the same services; they just sell it differently, and that's really where the, they differentiate themselves. This is entirely different. It's a virtuous industry. It is. It takes hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of dollars to develop a drug. Biogen's trial, uh, its phase three trial for Alzheimer's will cost $2 billion. Wow. Now who bears that risk? Not governments, it's shareholders that bear that risk. So all these innovative drugs that you've seen on the market is shareholders have borne that risk to bring these drugs to market. And with, in the case of Alzheimer's, is it's a bit of a gold rush. Many will fail and some will succeed in a mind-blowing way. And so, if you can make a difference in helping fund a company that brings a therapeutic uh, to market that transforms a pressing need, then we live in a society where that should be rewarded. Well, and a little bit more than just a great story at your next cocktail party. That's right, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So tell me, uh, and we're, we're gonna have to uh, wind, wind up soon, but tell me, tell me. Um, let's go back to the 90s and sure. 3TC. Yeah. Now you were at RBC at the time? I That's believe, correct, yeah. You, you were investing in the company that ultimately developed that medication, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So prior to um, Epivere or 3TC, as it was generically known before Epivere, AZT was this toxic drug, only drug available for HIV patients. Epivere came along, revolutionized the treatment for HIV. A Canadian company, Biochem Pharma, developed it in 
partnership with Glaxo. I remember when the CEO stood up in 1994 and projected that this would be a $400 million drug and everyone in the room laughed. Wow. By 2000, it was a billion dollar drug. And it revolutionized the treatment of HIV until it was acquired by Shire. But that is the kind of exciting thing that you can participate on. You are helping to fund and develop life-saving therapeutics. And you're on the edge of, uh, I think you, you actually referred yeah. to it as a, a, a well, chronic, I mean, the, yeah. the word I'm going to use is chronic. With yes. respect to my father had Parkinson's. Yes. You know, uh, our Alzheimer's, these kinds of diseases that are, that are slowly whittling away at, at an aging, well, not just an aging population. This is the tragedy of some That's of these the neurological tragedy. diseases. Right? Absolutely, because you know any CNS indication, central nervous system, um, you have MS, you have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, and you know a lot of these are just tied to to overproduction or underproduction of brain chemicals. Mm. You know, and so that's anything that can modify that will bring th some of these um, terrible diseases under control. And that's the aim. And the brain or neurology is the next frontier in biotech. A quarter of our fund is devoted to companies that are developing therapeutics in this space. So just to wrap up before we, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap it up here in a second. What about um, hair replacement? Um, we actually you know, speaking to a guy that could actually <laughs> use with that drug, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing you on all this other stuff, yes. all this life-saving stuff, but what about the lack of a full head of hair? That's, yes, that's, yeah. yes, what I know. You, what can you tell me about that? Even? Yeah, and, and, and you actually nailed it. That will be a huge market. Yeah. Are you investing any in, in any of those firms? We have a small <laughs> Canadian company oh, is that awesome. is developing, um, it's a regenerative uh, cell company, that's developing a solution to that. They're partnering with Sushido in, in Japan. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely an indication worth pursuing. There aren't many public companies. Uh, there is insight. It, uh, the irony is that uh, jack inhibitors have been shown to cause hair regrowth. And so there are companies that are developing jack inhibitors such as insight that are gonna go into an alopecia trial because that's a beneficial side effect. So there are little things like that are happening. There will be something. Well, I think what okay. we should be talking about in our next interview is innovation, because clearly we barely scratched the surface sure. on that notion. But the idea that the brain and neurology is the next wave. Yes. It's just 900 drugs being in trial. I mean, there's just so much room for um, discovery. We are at the cusp. Be pretty exciting. We're at the cusp of one of the most exciting phases in human history in drug development. Eden Rahim joining us today on Face to Face from Next Edge, uh, the Next Edge Biotech Plus Fund. Is that what I can call it? That's correct. And the company name is? Next Edge Capital. Next Edge Capital. Thanks, Eden, for joining us today. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm.